So I'm going to start by uh, asking and answering two fundamental questions about Newman's Own. First, what is Newman's Own? How do we think of it? And the way we think of Newman's Own is, is we refer to it as a philanthropic enterprise. Uh, you might think of that as being uh, one end of the spectrum of when business is getting into the area of business for the common good. It might might even think of it as the uh, anchor of that spectrum. It's the transition point from a nonprofit to a business that's totally 100% uh, committed. So we, uh, as a philanthropic enterprise, everything we do ends up with a charitable purpose. We give away 100% of our profits to charity. Uh, the next question I'm going to try to answer for you is, who is Paul Newman? Now, you've seen a little of that, but what I'd, I'd like to start by asking a question uh, of all of you uh, with a raise of hands. This is a young group out here. So everybody under 35, can you raise your hand if you know who Paul Newman? Everybody. OK. Boy, you guys really knew Paul. Now, how many knew of Paul because he was a movie star? Whoa, that's even more impressive. Um, well, Paul, that, that's unusual, because if I ask out of a group like this, it's usually one or two hands. And, and when I ask them why, they don't really know. They say, well, he's the guy in the popcorn, or my mother knew him, or something like that. But here's who Paul was. He, he was a, a really a, the major movie star of his time, uh, as I put up here. Uh, that's a picture of him, one of his early films. Uh, your mother is Paul Newman. That's, uh, uh, I, I'd like to lay claim that I looked like that with my shirt off at some point in my life. I never did. Um, way over on the, the right, this was Paul's last film, and that's the Generation Z. They would remember Paul Newman as Doc Hudson. In fact, the most recent uh, uh, release of the new uh, Cars movie, uh, Paul's voice was in that. We uh, granted a license for them to use a bit of his, uh, his voice uh, posthumously. But, but who Paul really was was this man in the middle. He, he was a very average human being. He was a man of immense humility. Uh, he was very talented. Uh, he, was almost, he was shy, actually, uh, for a man who was a, such a celebrity. He was a person who, who really spent a lot of time pondering what he thought of the role of, he referred to it as luck. Other people may have another name for it. But the role of the luck of circumstance in somebody's life, um, good luck and bad luck. Um, and he would say that you know he, he was lucky to have been born in America with all of the opportunities that afforded him, and was lucky to just happen to look right for the movies. And he would immediately say, I had nothing to do with any of that. You know, I, where I was born and how I looked, that, that had nothing to do with anything I did. It gave me opportunities. And he pondered those people who weren't so lucky in their lives and how he could help reduce those barriers of circumstance between just the bad luck of circumstance and the opportunities of lowering those barriers. So that's our founder, Paul Newman. We're not a Paul Newman cult, but understanding who he was was is very important to our story. So that segues into two more questions. Uh, 1982, when Paul started Newman's Own, um, he was asked on the Today Show uh, whether or not, and you heard a little bit of this uh, in the video, can a company that's going to give all its money away uh, possibly succeed? And the answer was, we don't know. Uh, Paul passed away in uh, September 2008, and I was uh, asked with great skepticism whether we could even survive without Paul Newman. So uh, this, this enterprise called Newman's Own, this philanthropic enterprise, to give you a picture of it, and its founding in 1982. Um, it's a single product, uh, two principles. You're, you heard those alluded to in the introduction. Uh, one was quality would always trump profits. Obviously, it was the quality of the ingredients. And by the way, Paul wasn't, and we aren't today, a prophesizing type of organization that goes out and says, here's the way you ought to do things. It's just our way of doing it. But we felt that the ingredients, and I wasn't there in the beginning, so Paul did, that what you find in a garden, what you find in nature, is really good food. It tastes good. Uh, it's, it's healthy. It tastes good. And then the other was 100% of profits to charity. Uh, we didn't have any employees. Uh, the office was a rented office. Paul actually 
without telling his wife, took the pool furniture to furnish it, and she didn't know Joanne until that spring, summer when it was brought out. Um, the bottom uh, principle here is the one that uh, this, the, our business planning, and this hung in Paul's office. He was very, very proud of this. It's now in our boardroom. It said, if I had a plan, I would be screwed. And that was the business proposition of, of Newman's own, that he was not a person who believed in planning. Um, he felt that planning, uh, I'm not saying that was a good thing. This was just Paul. He, remember, he was an artist. He, he felt that planning could constrain creativity, and it could also mute voices in an organization. Uh, that uh, is part of our culture, if you will, but it wasn't really a good business proposition. By the way, in his, in his office, the uh, other uh, piece of uh, literature that he had hanging there was Paul was on Nixon's 1971 uh, enemies list. He was number 19. Most of you are too young to remember that, but he was, I just read it today. Again, it's in my office now. It's a, Paul Neiman was a radical liberal, and he was. Believe me, he stood up for things like, terrible things like civil rights and voters' rights and stuff. And uh, he was put on this list, which he was very proud of being on. Uh, so if you fast forward to 2017, we now have 325 uh, food products. We compete against the biggest companies. We're not a niche player. We compete against the Unilevers, the Crafts, um, in their categories. Uh, we're not a, uh, you know, as I say, we don't just make a sausage and go sell that uh, to somebody. Uh, we have only have 85 employees in the entire organization. Um, that's our foundation, our licensing company, and, and the food company. Most are in the food company. We leverage ourselves through co-manufacturing. That's all of our recipe, our formula, but we are leveraged out, so our economic and headcount footprint is spread out through 20 co-packers. Um, this was not a plan that Paul had. Paul was a person who is fiscally very conservative, and like many entrepreneurs, I was one briefly uh, uh, starting my own company. I, I was always terrified that it was not going to work and I was going to lose my money, so I always wanted to keep the, the cost down. And, uh, and he, I think we're probably the only big diversified food company that uh, does all of its uh, manufacturing outside, doesn't own its own facilities. Um, we've upgraded our business thinking, um, but we still have underlying that integrated strategic and financial planning, a concept of what we call creative chaos, which really invites as many voices as possible into the company and making decisions, presenting ideas. Another uh, aspect of how the company is done is to look at the uh, 2017, this will be 35 years. This year we'll pass a half a billion, as you heard Hotch say in the video, in total giving. This year alone, we expect that we'll donate about $30 million, 29 and a half to $30 million to maybe 500 or so different kinds of charitable organizations. Some of them get very major investments and some are much smaller. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see that in the approximate eight, nine years since Paul's passing, we've almost come to parity with the total of giving in the previous uh, 26 years. Uh, so the company is doing well. And along the way, the company has demonstrated that, and I think you all know that, that business can do well and do good at the same time, that these not are not opposing forces. And I started my career when I got out of the Army. Uh, I was, uh, Paul was a, uh, in the Second World War. I was in Vietnam. Um, I started out as a director of corporate relations at a university, so I've been spending all of my career one way or the other working with the corporate sector in the area of social responsibility and philanthropy. So let's move over quickly and talk about our purpose and, and how we think about where our money is going to go and, and, and how we practice that. Uh, we have four big giving areas, and those are in the video. I won't go through those again, but they're so big you can drive a, a fleet of trucks through them. They're big windows to try to keep us organized uh, around our thinking about what kind of organizations we want to support. But, we really bring a business proposition to our uh, support. Uh, we always want to put a face to what we do. Um, we want to make sure that our money is serving somebody, is providing a benefit to people. But at the same time, we look for and hope for 
that something larger will come out of that, something that maybe, we're a great believer that good policy can come from the bottom up. It doesn't need to always be coming down from social policy, that is, social change. Uh, we think of the nonprofit sector, particularly in the United States, as kind of the R&D of society. It's where a lot of experimentation takes place. Government then can go scale things. And, uh, but uh, we, we uh, try to be an equal partner with our, our grantees. Uh, we want to make sure that they're telling us the good and the bad, and, and we're being very transparent. We engage ourselves beyond our dollars. We try to leverage our resources our human resources, our brand, our, our expertise, whatever we can do, we actively work in fundraising with them. And then the last one, which is important is for me in particular, having worked in the nonprofit sector, is that we measure steps, but we don't measure impact. We evaluate impact. And what do I mean by that? I take students at Columbia. You can't measure or you can't evaluate your impact, in my view, or our view until you're finished with your careers, perhaps. What have you done with your lives? What have you done with your careers? It's not how well you did in terms of the scores of tests getting in or the kind of honors you might have received at graduation. Those are very important, and those are steps. But it's what you do with your life, the impact that you're making in the long term, which is hard to really put hard metrics around. We evaluate that. It's a softer term. Um, how are we doing for time? Anybody a timekeeper here? Two minutes, okay. This is one quick uh, example of, of one of our grantees that I'd like to go through. We work in Cabarrus, probably the largest slum in Africa. Um, over a million people in something the size of uh, Central Park. Um, and, you know, just a terrible place. Uh, the, this little, this quote, one of the quotation marks is missing but from Eunice. Uh, I'm her host grandparent, and uh, Eunice wrote a poem in which she said, I come from a nasty, awkward, neglected world. This is a 12-year-old girl writing this poem, and it is. Uh, no public services, just a terrible place. Um, and um, the faces, um, again, this is a typo. It shouldn't say the facts. It should say the faces. Uh, the two founders, Jessica and Kennedy Odede, Kennedy grew up in uh, Kibera, he was in gangs, he never, never went to school, uh, you know, had a terrible life, uh, ended up, by the way, graduating from Wesleyan with honors without ever having been in a classroom prior to then. Uh, very, very big story behind that. Um, and so they were the face. They came to see me. Uh, they were, he was a sophomore at Wesleyan, I think she was in her senior year at Wesleyan. Um, and these are the girls when I thought to myself, well, if, if we can help educate one of these girls, we haven't lost our money. Um, we've done all of these things. We started with a $50,000 investment. We're up to $5 million. These are the many things that we've done beyond um, our dollars. This is where they are today. Um, they are now in two slums going into two more. They've gone from 23 students to over 400, from 40 unique individuals a year they're serving to over 180,000. But more importantly, they are actually, whoops, transfer, uh, transforming the way people think about uh, funders, policymakers, and others are thinking about how you bring sustainable transformation into slums. It's a real beautiful story. Uh, they're now about 30 years old, 31 years old, something like that. Uh, this is just to point out that there are other organizations, companies now that are following the Newman Zone model. We just had a meeting with some of them. We have a program to encourage this, to convene them, uh, to bring expertise uh, to other philanthropic enterprises. Indeed, we're investing in them. Uh, we've made a couple of financial investments in them. Uh, they're a combination of young people coming out of business schools uh, and uh, just out of college but they're also uh, people who have been very successful in their careers who are coming back in to use business as a way to give back and participate in, in the common good. The last thing, and this is going to be the segue, so I won't use up the, more of my time, is one of the organizations that we did help find or uh, find, uh, be a founder of, Paul Newman, 
uh, is CECP, which puts the faces of businesses to work, the CEOs and all of the employees and the resources. And we're going to show a little video here that hopefully Daryl is here and, and uh, yep, Courtney, and we'll show you this video and then we'll have a little panel discussion. You are a founder of an organization called the Committee Encouraging Corporate Philanthropy, which is an organization of about 150 chief executives organized to encourage corporations to act more philanthropically. There's controversy about this subject. Some feel it's the right thing for companies to do, and others feel it's not the right thing. The company's purpose is to earn profit, give it to their shareholders. What is your thinking on this? You have a responsibility to you but you have a responsibility to the community as well. And uh, I, uh, the corporate is not just an inhuman money machine. I mean, they, they have to ex accept the fact that they exist inside of, of a community. And I think they have some uh, moral responsibility to, um, to be involved to be engaged into that community. They just can't sit there and not um, acknowledge the fact that, that uh, there's stuff going on around them. Mm -hmm. Do you think they're doing enough? Well, I think they could do more. Daryl and Courtney. Hello, Great. Buddy. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Bob, and it's really a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for showing that video. Um, it's amazing to hear about the history of Newman's Own, and CECP is so proud <laughs> to share the legacy of Paul Newman. Daryl, we've heard a bit about social enterprises, and I know that many of you today have been doing design thinking about how to create solutions through business. CECP, since the time that it was founded with Paul Newman, has now grown to be over 200 companies. So what do you see in terms of business leaders today? How can leaders of large companies that have billions of dollars of revenue, what's their role in addressing societal challenges? Sure, sure. Thank you, Courtney, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, well, I think we are seeing CEOs really take in many ways a leadership role and position in a, an increasing way as they have historically. You know, a few of the examples that I think are really doing some neat stuff is one guy is, is Bob Forster right here. Not sure about the jacket he wears, <laughs> but certainly the leadership he's having, the kind of the impact he's having with Newman's Own, which is, you know, multiplies its, its impact in, in, in a huge way. You know, a, a mid-sized company that really plays along with some of the really largest companies in the world in terms of really how they're making a positive impact in society. But we're seeing CEOs make differences in a lot of ways. Some are stepping up on key issues. I'll give you an example of that. Um, others are collaborating with fellow CEOs and companies to really make an impact on, on key issues. Um, and still others are really transforming their companies and leveraging their assets to make a, a difference. Um, I don't know if anybody followed the whole Charlottesville situation. A, a few, right? And uh, having been a graduate of the University of Virginia, Ken Frazier is the CEO of Merck. Anybody heard of Merck? Merck, very successful program, the Merck for Mothers program. Uh, you know, Ken grew up in, in Philadelphia, African-American, uh, single parent situation, CEO of Merck. And the Monday after that, he really became the first uh, uh, of the CEOs to step up to the administration. He was on the president's council and said, look, I, I really can't be a part of this. And there were some people who thought that was a very risky thing. What were his shareholders going to do? What was the president going to do? The president tweeted back and, and all those things, but he stood up and other CEOs joined him. And they basically said, look, we, we've got to make sure we're really creating a, a more just society and that we, we need to have an impact on that. So a very bold move on his part. Um, I talked to one of his directors, board directors, and they were quite concerned. But you know, investors, actually, the share price of the company went up that day, which wasn't what he was entitled to do, entitled, but he was focused on what really, really kind of mattered in that area. Uh, we're also going to be honoring CEOs from Minneapolis. Anybody from Minneapolis? Minnesota? West, we got a Minneapolis? All right, here we go. Very good. All right, there we go. Minneapolis is all way over there. Anybody from like New Jersey or anything? I mean, we got a. Uh, 
But we're going to be honoring CEOs from Minneapolis, which do a really a tremendous job of really working within their community. Companies like General Mills and Best Buy and, and, and others and Ecolab to really make a difference. They partner and they work together with a project. They get together members of their companies on a regular basis to support the Twin Cities and throughout uh, Minneapolis and, and you know, great support uh, on those. Um, another is a company, UPS. Anybody know UPS, the trucks? So I just a quick one. David Abney's their CEO, really want to leverage their capabilities, and they drive trucks. And if anybody's been reading in uh, the Puerto Rico situation right now, so I was on a, a panel earlier uh, this week with, with a woman who was, I would say, very anti-business, was talking about boycotting this and boycotting that, and it's kind of slow down. So well, what, are you try, what, are you, what are you trying to get done right now? I said, well, I, I sit on the, the Port Authority, uh, board of directors, we have three tr ships that are ready to be loaded to send to Puerto Rico, but we can't send them unless somebody can deliver product in Puerto Rico. Right? If you don't have trucks, you just can't keep them in there. So I called up the people at UPS, good friends, their CEO, and said, hey guys, can you help them out a bit? Well, they talked, and these ships are now on their way. I mean, that's the kind of an impact that companies can have because of their scale, because of their resources, because of, really, I also think the leadership of the companies, they're probably not going to make more money on that but they see that as their obligation and responsibility at UPS. So those are the kind of things we see, we encourage, and as Paul says, we think companies can do even more. Such great examples, Daryl. In addition to that, there's, of course, huge philanthropic giving, but companies have these unique resources and a unique voice that they can lend to many important social issues. Um, I did want to mention there's a comment section in the app under this session if anyone wants to submit a question. Um, Bob, Daryl was talking about some outspoken CEOs really kind of taking the mantle of advocacy, but also many times large companies are under certain constraints that um, social enterprises or other smaller companies may not be subject to. What are some kind of risks that um, social enterprises, companies like Newman Zone, have the freedom to take on that might differ from some of the larger, more established companies? Good question. First of all, Daryl, I'm going to talk to you about the jacket thing later. <laughs> uh, this is going to be happening. All <laughs> this will come on forever. Uh, in terms of us as a business, uh, you know, we we have the same kind of risk analysis that any big company, except we're not quite as sophisticated. Obviously, we don't have that kind of depth of resource. But when you move over to what we do in the social purpose sector, uh, we are very agile. We can move fast. Uh, the reason, one of the reasons I was presenting Shining Hope is that uh, two young people, one a sophomore and the other a senior in college, coming to a, a funder, they're not a very fundable uh, objective, if you will. And we're able to move very, very quickly, mm -hmm. bring in a lot of intuition. We can put a lot of, we can put ourselves at risk in that, in that way, and, and uh, other companies. Uh, where they can do better is they can take these things if we prove them to scale. We simply don't have the scaling ca capacity that a big corporation has. Um, but we're constantly uh, trying to find the needs that aren't being met that, again, meet this uh, requirement of putting a face to it and also for having potential for larger impact. We've just initiated a program to um, work with our Native American populations in the area of nutrition and have created a cohort of a, a dozen such uh, Native American managed organizations. And uh, nutrition, if they're going to break through this barrier of luck, they're going to have to get better nutrition into their, their food systems. And uh, if we can demonstrate what we're doing there, then the other food companies will come in and, and participate. And indeed, our government will participate. So um, we don't have a lot of meetings. We don't write a lot of memos. Uh, probably the biggest impediment to making decisions is me, because I get so backed up. I <laughs> sometimes don't get the stuff out. But, uh, but even then, it's pretty fast. We, you know, we can do it on the spot if we need to. That's great. The ability to move quickly and, as you said, to take risks on sort of newer social, social leaders is mm -hmm. really valuable and then helping, you know, provide the bridges also for other companies or other organizations to take them to scale. We do know from companies sometimes there are other hurdles of more established organizations that they need to be able to work with, so that type of work is so valuable. And we see in social enterprises that 
the purpose is baked into the company, we, literally in the Newman sense. Um, it's baked into the product, it's baked into the heart and soul of the company. But Daryl, we've seen some larger companies that you might not necessarily expect doing some real ser soul searching as to their you know, deeper social purpose. Um, is that a trend that you're tracking and what are some examples? Yeah, we, we are seeing a, a real growth in this notion of, of, of purpose. Uh, you know, sort of in, in Newman's own case, you know, what they lack in scale, they more than make up for in focus and in purpose. You know, clear direction of what they're going to do to help make the, uh, the, the world a better, uh, better place. Uh, and, and most companies, if you go back to the original founder, um, had a real sense of purpose, what they were trying to do. Sometimes as they then brought in professional managers, and I'm an MBA and all the rest, these MBA students and business school students educated these elite institutions, they sometimes lose that purpose and the focus becomes a spreadsheet. You know, that's how we're really going to drive it. But they kind of lose the essence of that. You know, but, but Henry Ford talked about how everybody could have transportation. Uh, John Dorrance, the founder of Campbell's Soup, was how you could have efficient vegetables delivered to people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, modern day CEOs like Howard Schultz at Starbucks, right? Is, there was a real purpose and entity of what those companies are about. And companies move away from that. We're seeing a move back for companies from that. Part of it is driven um, through, I think, the power of social media. Part of it's millennials, uh, folks like Bob and myself and you guys, us <laughs> guys are all together. Um, but all seeing that we can have a, a greater, we want to be part of something great. It's not about making money and at the end giving it all away. How do I make a positive impact day in and day out? Uh, one of the companies we think that does a terrific job of that is PwC. PricewaterhouseCoopers, the uh, consultants auditing firm, et cetera. Uh, they have a woman who's one of the best in the field on this, Shannon Schuyler. And her title, one of my favorite titles in business, is Chief Purpose Officer. You know, they have tens of thousands of employees, and they really want to connect to how they can support the companies they serve, but how that also works for their, their, their critical employees as well. Another of my favorites is Essilor. Anybody heard of Essilor? No, Essilor, French company. Anybody have a pair of glasses? Right, wear glasses. Chances are your lenses were probably made by Essilor, world's largest eyeglass company. Uh, their vision is vision. Right, focused on vision around the globe. Uh, and they have a, one of their lead, their executives who ran their Asian business, fastest growing, is now their chief mission officer. And their goal is to help everybody in the world to be able to see, to be able to have glasses they can see. Two billion people in the world today, do, you know, should, if they had glasses, could see. And if you don't have, take your glasses off in the back row, how well would you function without those? Could you imagine doing that in an emerging economy and trying to get by and all? So they really have a huge area and they're you know, getting tens of millions of people each year to be able to see. What they actually find out is not only was that good for those people, good for society and leverage their capabilities, but the 80% of those people come back within a few years to buy glasses, which they never would have done before because they weren't contributing members of society. So those are some really good examples of people building purpose into their entity, into their organization. Mm -hmm. And Bob, is someone, if there's someone who wants to address specific social issues, why start a social enterprise? Why not start a nonprofit? And if you go the social enterprise side um, with that direction, what are the challenges of trying to run a business at the same time that you're trying to address critical needs in the community? Well, I think the people we know and how we feel about it and the people we're working with, um, they, they have the same sense of drive and motivation to uh, do something to help make our world a better place is what you see in the nonprofit sector, the public charitable sector. Uh, the, the difference is, is that they really believe in business. Uh, they believe that the dynamic of business really provides an energy. Um, there are days, for instance, at Neiman's Own that I wish I, we were a traditional foundation and we just had a big, big investment fund. Um, and I didn't have to worry about these people called consumers who would be so you know, punitive if you're not really fulfilling the promise of the brand, competitors and other things. But that really brings a relevancy. So the people we've seen inside the sector are just... They just want to combine what I, I refer to as the two most widely admired aspects of the American character, if you will, business entrepreneurship, the energy, the sense of, of purpose that comes just from being in that sector, competing, innovating, doing everything a business does, winning some, losing some, with the other aspect, which is philanthropic generosity. Um, so it's, it, 
you know, we're kind of at the tipping point from a classic nonprofit into a commercial enterprise. And, and keep in mind that all nonprofits, particularly when they come to scale, they're, they better be operating like businesses too. Um, and any question from, from the uh, audience here, any resistance to your business model? No resistance other than the fact that we're not legal. Uh, that's that's a, not a resistance, that's a fact. <laughs> we, we're dealing with a small issue in Congress that in 1969 there was a, um, uh, what, a tax act at that time that uh, really does, took away the opportunity for this type of business to continue after the founder's passing. Uh, we had legislation introduced um, uh, the last four Congresses to remedy this. and. We've had no resistance. We simply had a Congress that is, hasn't moved uh, in so long as we, we all know. But there are special challenges that if you're a business, particularly like ours, uh, it's, it's very difficult to access capital to grow. All of our growth comes from internally generated funds. And because we have this promise to give it all away, what we can actually retain for investment is also limited. So that's a real issue. Mm -hmm. And it, I think we would, um, we're, we at Newman's Own are really working to put together funding financing vehicles um, for social enterprises and particularly those at, at our end of the scale that are giving it all away. Because it's pretty hard to go out to an investor and say, make an investment, <laughs> by the way, you'll never see this money again, <laughs> uh, but it's going to do a lot of good. But there are lots of people out there in foundations that if, if you can do this the right way, you can, I believe, get a, do a syndication of some sort where those do, uh, investors will make the same commitment and could be put into the investment documents that they'll use any pro profits they receive to donate back. So we're working on that type of uh, model right now. That's a big challenge. And Daryl, in the interest of time, I'm going to incorporate questions from the audience sure. um, as we go forward here. But um, there was a clarifying question about the industries we work with and if we need more representation from any industries. And then also, just wanted to um, reflect on one of the challenges we hear from our CEOs, which is that the short-term pressures often are one of the biggest hurdles to working with all st stakeholders. And what is it about uh, short-term pressures that can prohibit a more comprehensive strategy that serves the community, employees, and others? And are there some examples of sure. CEOs? Great. Let me try to address probably. those questions. I also want to comment a bit on, as we talk about nonprofits, as we talk about social enterprise, which play an enormously positive role. But also, big companies can be a place to really make a positive impact. Uh, and and I, I think that as you think about options, there are, because of the scale, because of the resources, um, you know, when CSP was founded about almost 20 years ago, there were less than 10 of the S&P or the Fortune 500 companies that did CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility reports. Today, there's less than 10 that don't do it. So literally, it's gone from 10 to nearly all of the companies. And so companies are finding more responsibility because of millennials, because of their customers, and because it actually is good for business in the long term, which we'll, we'll, we'll touch base on. Um, our uh, daughter has a, a master's sustainability. I said, ah, where are you going to go with this thing? And um, worked with nonprofits for a few years. She's now working for a, a Fortune 200 firm. Um, and she said, Dad, it's, it's so great. I mean, we don't, we're not raising money all the time. Uh, we can make an enormous impact. We know so much about what we do. They're also helping on some of the work in Puerto Rico and on the disaster relief. They have a real focus there in the uh, apparel industry on cotton growing and how can we make that much more sustainable. So there are opportunities in big companies as well to make those difference. There is other uh, conflicting sometimes objectives which makes it a bit more challenging, but that scale, particularly in ones that are purpose driven, can really be, be quite good. From a CCP perspective, we work with all industries. Uh, our goal as companies need to be big companies um, in the Fortune 500 or, or bigger, I think we have 68 of the Fortune 100 are part of CCP, or we have a select number of pace setters like Newman's Own that are really helping to lead the way, the companies of the future. So that's our, our mix, and we really touch base on 
virtually every industry that's out there that has some, some scale and some size. Uh, we, we started in New York, so we're very strong in financial services. Uh, we're growing our tech businesses, good in consumer, uh, and building our business uh, and our organization and companies around the globe as, as, as well. So, uh, in fact, Bob and I go to an Italian conference every year, which must be where he got his, his jacket from. Um, I'm looking at those socks. And, well, socks, yeah, I, I got mine from there as well. And we're really talking with, with CEOs in Italy about how they can also help to be part of this, this, this effort. So we are seeing interest, in, interest across all industries. One of the challenges, if you're not a nonprofit, if you're not family owned, is how do you do with this if your company is publicly traded in the public markets? And every day we read about Wall Street Journal and the stock prices go up and you know, Ken Frazier shouldn't have said anything, his stock price might have gone down. And that does put enormous pressure uh, on companies to deliver on the, in the short term and forget about the long term. And that's one area that we're really trying to push back against. Frankly, if there's one area as uh, if I was a student today that I think is the biggest issue you guys face, is a bunch of people like us and others who only care about the short term, who aren't putting the investment in infrastructure and education to really build a better world for the future. Um, that's a whole other issue. The fact that the amount of money that we're paying on, on debt and things like that is just you know, crazy, and that's what we need to do if we're going to build a great, great world. What we're trying to do in CCP, and we have some companies that are ready to st are stepping up, is to align the vast majority of investors actually care about the long term. There's a bunch of traders, many of them came from Columbia, more from NYU, um, and other schools that are trading every day, and they don't really care about the business they're in. They're trying to make money on the churn. And what we're really focused on is getting those investors who have a longer-term horizon, pension funds, people like Vanguard, BlackRock are man managing retirement money, and having them at the table because they own the majority of companies, but don't always have the most, make most of the noise. They're actually pretty quiet. So we've really created that. Uh, one of our favorite CEOs in that is Mark Bertolini at Aetna, the health provider, um, who basically went into his CEOs or to his investors and said, I'm going to fire some of you. I don't want your money. You are so short-term oriented. All you care about is this. We're trying to really help improve and fix the American healthcare system. That's the investors we need to have. He did that. He then increased the wage rates of his lowest paid employees by some 50% to care of their health care area. Oh, it's going to come to an end, and their stock price has nearly doubled since he did that, which is about 18 months ago. So you can do it. You've got to know what you're doing in that area, but that's the kind of behavior that we're encouraging to really think about. Got to deliver, we deal day in and day out in the short term, but how do we really create a world where we're thinking longer term? particularly among those who have the resources. Most people in the world don't have a choice. They have to get by day to day. But places like Columbia, great companies, great institutions, need to be, governments, governments need to be thinking forward about how we're building a better world. Absolutely, and it's great to see the conversation at the strategic business level, talking about how it integrates with their long-term plan. Um, Bob, uh, yeah, go ahead. May I just comment on something Daryl said? That I, you know, Aetna is a great, I think, case study somebody should do at some point, Columbia Business School. Uh, I was, when I worked at the university, it was in Hartford, and I worked with the then CEOs of Aetna way, way back. Right. And Aetna was an incredibly engaged, socially engaged company. Uh, but there was so many, much disruption that took place uh, between the early 80s through the 90s, uh, one of them being the point where stock was held broadly by individuals that began to get aggregated into these money funds. And I saw a number the other day that really stunned me that I, I believe the private equity held companies now in America are much, much more numerous than the publicly traded companies by a pretty significant. Publicly traded companies I think have gone from 7,000 or so down to around 4,000. Yeah, yeah, almost half. Um, so you, when we started CECP, Paul Newman uh, the way it started, as you know, Daryl, is that Paul wanted to go out and, and uh, essentially harangue some CEOs and give more money. And I said, CEOs are good people. It's the pressures they now face and short-termism and this aggregation of shares was really disrupting the internal cultures. Um, and, and you had a different kind of person come in. Right. And I think CECP has been a incredible force in making a change there. And the last bit of it is this initiative that you have in bringing in the long-term investors to begin to say, don't stop talk, almost mm -hmm. don't talk about quarterly stuff. We want to see value created. And we believe that a company's role in society 
uh, creates long-term value in the company. So that's going to be a breakthrough. It's a big one. And that helps to address a couple of the questions about, um, there's a question about, does CCP steer our companies towards a specific area? And we really don't. We know our companies invest in all areas, but that we can help support areas that we know are a priority. We do see increased focus on STEM education, for example, uh, among other areas. And our model is a membership model. We're a nonprofit organization, but we also offer deeper dives with companies um, to get more support or communities of companies. Um, Bob, there's a question about your model um, and also just some advice for the students here about how you expand the business when you give away your profit and do you reinvest? But then, so that's kind of a technical question, but I um, wanted to make sure you have an opportunity to, to share your comments on the role students should have in creating the future of social enterprises? Well, uh, I just wish we could harness all of, and I know, I think it's not, we don't have to encourage young people now to get involved. Um, it's just wonderful the, the, how this has grown. I can recall when I began to see the, the beginnings of this, I was, had my consultancy at that time, and I had these very bright young people who are working at Goldman that went to the best schools and had MBAs and they've been at Goldman and other big firms for quite some time and they began to show up in my office and was just saying, I'm doing well but it doesn't feel right. And I think this blossomed now into just such a tremendous movement uh, among young people. Uh, Daryl and I and Courtney know that the young people are as much interviewing the companies as the companies are interviewing them when it comes to a company's engagement socially. I think, um, you know, it, how you do it, uh, it depends on where you're coming from. Uh, the one thing you need to do if you're going into a philanthropic enterprise, you really need to step up to the issues that uh, you're giving away your ability to create great wealth. You can pay yourself well. You can have good 401ks. Uh, we, we run a food company, as I said earlier, that competes against Kraft, mm -hmm. uh, Unilever, all of these guys. So we, we just can't go out and pay a little bit of money. But we can't give the big bumps of equity participation. We, uh, and we try to be as generous as we can. Um, so it's not that you're going to you know, uh, take vows of poverty if you get into any of this space. It's, it's not necessary to do. Um, but I think to get into it is there are many different places. The, I know Columbia has developed its program uh, beautifully. There's, the, there's so many universities now that are beginning to connect. I was just with a, this past weekend with a professor from uh, Toronto, which has a program, University of Bocconi, as I mentioned earlier, in Italy. And there's such a great network that is, that is growing out. Um, so there are many different places to get there, but if you're going to go into the social enterprise, really be true to the social enterprise, whether it's a philanthropic enterprise or a true social enterprise, the one thing I would encourage is to make your true north that purpose. Um, one of the great worries that I have right now in this area is that there are some that are using what looks to be purpose-driven business to help just grow their businesses. And that is going to hurt everybody at some point uh, in many different ways. If, if, and it's going to hurt the nonprofit community. So if you're going to get in there, you know, really walk the walk, if you will, and, and really say, we're, we're there. We're going to put it into our governing documents. We're going to do other things that really seal this, because it's not just about you. It's about other social enterprise entrepreneurs who are going to try to create a movement here. So I hope that's responsive. Great, absolutely. And um, we'll be around for a while after this if you want to address some of the questions we weren't able to get to in the panel aspect of this. But I did want to draw your attention. Some of you may have noticed as you were cutting your coffee some activity around the Newmanitarian display here, which is so true to the spirit of Paul Newman that he really genuinely believed that philanthropy and giving back was something that everyone, every individual and, uh, and every company had the ability to do, and that small acts are important. So the humanitarian campaign really encourages all of us to consider what is it that we can do? Is it helping someone out? Is it something with our time, a talent, um, giving money to, um, you know, to a cause or to 
um, help another person in need. So certainly encourage you to think about how you can pay it forward and take a picture with Paul, hashtag it, and make that commitment um, so that we can all you know, take small steps to a greater future for everybody. And wanted to share a really brief video on the new man humanitarian campaign. Oh. What's gotten into her? This morning, she couldn't make a peanut butter sandwich. Now she tells me to get out of my kitchen? What's going on in there? Where are you going? She hasn't even checked her phone once today. I don't know what's gotten into her, but I like it. I can't think of a better way to, um, to conclude our formal panel here, but thank you so much to Bob Forrester for inviting CECP to join you, and to Daryl for your leadership, and to all of you at this conference today. So thank you so much. Thank you very much.